Welcome to the Deep Waters Podcast. We pray that Christ is at the beginning and end of all we do. May openness and peace mark our discussions. As we engage in conversations about the fresh move of God, may our hearts be drawn to unity. And in all things, may this shape us to look more like you, Jesus. Amen. Now grab a mug of your favorite tea and enjoy the Deep Waters Podcast. knocking on your mug i want i really wanted the clinking noise oh like you're trying to make a toast yeah clink clink i doubt many people are drinking tea this time of year it's a stretch for me maybe iced tea there's this really great iced berry hibiscus tea at hyde perk that i drink when it's hot it's very refreshing i love tea i do love tea i love Mm. iced tea but iced coffee nowadays is so nice. Mm, that's the stuff. What's your order of choice? You're mm, all over the place. You it, have a different yeah. order every time. Actually, this week, Laura and I went to Starbucks and I got a tall vanilla bean frappuccino. Wow. Well done. And I wasn't expecting to do that. But I was like, I actually have a cankering for the vanilla bean <laughs> frappuccino right now. I feel um, a little peckish for the vanilla bean frappuccino. Whoa. Good. I'm glad you brought that word into this. Word of the day. All right. If you happen <laughs> to be watching this podcast on yeah. YouTube, we want you to comment below what your drink of choice is this time of year. Yeah. Now we have like a dynamic comment space to utilize. I know that you can't really comment on Apple Podcasts or Spotify in the same way, can you? If you do comment, we will respond. That'd I be hope so you know fun. That. Yes, send us an email. We will respond. That too. Deepwaters at riverhouseministries.com. <laughs> Hit us up. Wow, that's fun. It's okay. been cool. We, we, uh, this, is, this podcast is coming out the week after our podcast with Darren. Right. The week before that, we've gotten a lot of really great feedback from people in person about our podcast about the prosperity gospel, which was yes. really exciting. So fun. And encouraging. So it's like, it's not, I mean, you don't have to give us all good feedback. Mm-hmm. I mean, we like the good feedback, Yep. but we also want your questions. Like, I don't understand what this meant, or you seemed a little and completely wrong when you said this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you sent, you sounded just a tad, just completely off base. <laughs> yeah. Or I don't think that Joel Osteen is a prosperity preacher actually. So, mm-hmm. um, will you talk more about that? Yeah. He's my uncle. Yeah. He's my uncle. <laughs> that was rude. <laughs> if he is your uncle, thanks for listening. Yeah, totally. Let's have lunch. Let's have Joel Zine <laughs> on the podcast. Whoa, honestly, I'd love that. That'd be so fascinating. Hmm. Is there anyone that we wouldn't want on the podcast? I plead the fifth. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> For sure. Right after I asked that question, I realized we shouldn't talk about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but who we did have on the podcast last week was our new friend, wonderful friend, yeah. Darren Roundson who was so gracious to come and visit our church and to give us so much of his energy and wisdom and time. And we're going to unpack over the next four weeks, including today, um, a lot of what he said in his sermon while he was here. You don't have to have heard his sermon in order to enjoy these podcasts because we'll give you context. But if you want, he says it all really, really well. So what was the date of that sermon? That was uh, um, the let's 23rd. See. Sunday, the 23rd mm-hmm. of July. Of July. Good call. 2023. Yes. In mm-hmm. the year of our Lord. If you're listening to this podcast and it's 2028, let me know. I'll buy you coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so crazy. That'd be crazy. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Yeah. I don't know if we're, we'll see. Yeah where our content will be then, but all for um, the Lord. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Unpacking a lot of what he said, because at least for me, I, I I think you told me that you felt similarly, Jace, but it seemed like Darren had so much to deliver and it was all so good. And a lot of it, um, there was especially one part of his sermon where he kind of like ran through seven points that felt too quick for me to even write down. I was keeping notes. I'm pretty sure he talked about with his church, he did those each as a sermon on its own. Yeah. So it's like, I think there's just a lot of content in what he shared and a lot of it hasn't been completely tapped. It's been tapped in different ways at River House. Um, mm. And so I think it's going to be good to go through it. Yeah. 
So that's what we'll do. Let's do it. Okay. Praise mm-hmm. God. We're opening with this whole contrast that he created between consumeristic Christianity mm-hmm. and radical discipleship, which I really liked those words. Totally. Um, I'm curious. I don't know. When you think about consumeristic Christianity, what does that mean to you, Jace? That's a good question. I think I, I picture kind of the, the mega church phase of the American church where it's just, everything is done to get really new or just other Christians to come to your church. Huh. You know, huh. I felt like for a while the American church and I pray we're not doing that now, especially at river house, but it was like, how do we just get the people that like Christian stuff to like our Christian stuff more? Whoa. So, and okay. My answer is pointing a lot of blame at the churches themselves. I don't think that's where all the blame goes. Hmm. I think consumer Christianity in my mind is a takes two to tango Sure. and being in such a cultural soup that is so focused on, um, consumption. Uh, we naturally wanted easy to digest things and really didn't want to have conversations or sit through experiences that we didn't like because, well, why I don't do that in any other part of my life. If I'm turning on Netflix, I start a show that I don't really love. I'm not even getting, I'm like, I'll look for something else, you know? Yeah. It's like, but through that is contrasted to, I guess what Darren talks about, radical discipleship. Sure. That's good. We, it's like we live in this culture that is so consumeristic. Our economy is focused on efficiency Mm -hmm. that it makes sense that I want to be in church. I want to worship the two and a half songs, hear a brief message that encourages me and makes me feel comfortable and be out of there in 59 minutes or less. Totally. And I don't want traffic out of the church parking lot to be a hassle Yeah. because I need to get home and start doing this, that, or the other thing because I I don't know. We just live in this efficiency culture for sure. Don't you think where we're in taking and I think I like the word consumeristic Christianity because I think it points to the soup that we live in, especially in the United States, maybe in just the the West, the West, I would say like capitalism Mm -hmm. um, with the free market or economics being what they are. Yeah. Um, it's all geared to promote efficiency and mm -hmm. yeah, efficiency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as a result of efficiency, I think hurry and, um, sometimes neglect of the care and time that a particular thing needs. Totally. I I think we've, I've mentioned this example before on the podcast, but I think it's applicable here even of the difference between like an olive garden here in the States and just like an Italian restaurant in Rome. Whoa. Yeah. Where the, like Olive Garden, there's a tablet at your table, you order quick, it comes out, you're in and out like under an hour. Um, the food's just kind of ready made, ready to go warm it up. Um, at least that's in my mind. Maybe it's higher quality than that. (laughs) Don't come at me. Olive Garden. (laughs) Um, I know you're listening, but don't come at me. Um, but you go to Italy and like there's time, like there's handmade pasta that's slowly, you know, rolled out in the morning and hung to dry. I don't know what you do with pasta. And uh, <laughs> you hang it to dry. Well, oh. I think I've seen, you Maybe know, they do. They yeah. like hang it or something. Sure. Uh, but like the whole dinner is going to take three hours mm. because you just eat slow and it's there for, you're there to have conversation and, um, and the food takes long to prepare. They're not going to just have it ready made in like a bunch of big pots and huh. stuff. So where was I going with this? I was going saying that, yeah, the difference between this like consumer culture that we're in. Right. Efficiency culture. The efficiency culture. It like needs to be pointed out because, because it is the soup that we swim in. It's very easy to not recognize that we're even swimming in it because we've been here it's like um, David Foster Wallace said in that great commencement speech, uh, one fish swam past another and said, hey, bud, how's the water? Mm-hmm. And then they swim a little further. And then the second fish says, what's water? Yeah, totally. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's the substance that I've existed in this entire time. But because I've never existed outside of it, I didn't even know that it was it. Wow. 
Yeah. Or that it's Great been influencing reference. me. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. David Foster Wallace, everybody. Yeah. Genius. That's a great convincing speech. It really is. Very thought provoking. If you haven't heard it, check it out. Um, so consumeristic Christianity on one end. I thought this was yeah. funny. Darren pointed out in his sermon that the word Christian only appears in the New Testament three times. Um, I think we're called Christians in Acts for the first time at uh, Antioch. Okay. Um, there's even evidence that we have that Christian was not used as a title of Christians by Christians for a long time. It was more derogatory. Yeah. Is that right. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Like it, almost like a, you just like a little Christ, like little, like little imitation. Have we talked about know. this on the podcast? I'm trying to remember little Christ. Yeah. Like even the word Christian, because as somewhere I did some research and I thought it was for the podcast that, um, if you were a follower of the way of Caesar Augustus, you mm-hmm. were called an Augustinian. Oh, wow. Um, or Octavius, you were called an Octavian. Mm-hmm. Christian was just like a little Christ. So the way that um, the way that the Romans talked about followers of a particular person was just in by by adding like the little. Um, suffix at the end like a kardashianian <laughs> <laughs> yeah shout out to all the kardashianians oh, that's super funny um so it, anyway it was a term used by the roman secular world to talk about people who are following jesus not by the people who are following jesus mm-hmm. for at least a hundred years i think maybe even longer they referred to the faith as the way for a really long time. The cross was not a predominant symbol of the faith until I think the three hundreds. Wow. They used the fish. Yeah. I've heard that. And the Cairo. Have you seen the Cairo? Oh. That's the, like what looks like an X and a P on top of it. Oh yeah. You've seen that for some reason that reminds me of like pirates or something. Oh, funny. Now that you say that. Yeah. That's um the X is the Greek letter Chi. Like this. Yes, exactly. That's it. Can you see this? Cairo. You can look it up. All right. Um, so the X is actually a chi in Greek. Mm-hmm. It's a letter. And the, the P isn't a P. It's an it's a row, which are the first two letters of Christus in Greek. Oh, wow. So that's just an abbreviation of the word Christ. That's amazing. In symbol form. Not to get too deep into the word Christian. <laughs> sure. Where does the term Christ come from? Oh, Was wow. That a Hebrew word? Like... Yeah. Did they ha- like, yeah, I'm just real fast. Can you touch on that? Do you know? Just in short. Yeah. Christ is a Greek word that means uh, anointed one. Okay. The Hebrew equivalent is Messiah. Okay. So Mashiach mm-hmm. is the Hebrew word that means to be smeared with oil. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> anointed. Anointed. Mm-hmm. Um, so literally smearing with oil is to anoint someone. That's to Mashiach someone. And if you were smeared with oil, which meant you were like cleansed and set apart, anointed, um, like you were prepared for a particular purpose. Yeah. And the only people who were anointed in the Old Testament, I believe, were priests, kings, and one prophet supposedly claimed, I think Elijah claimed that he was supposed to have anointed Elisha. Okay. Don't quote me on that. There's yeah. something in there. But like priest, king, for sure, mm-hmm. are anointed people, maybe a prophet has been anointed in the old Testament. And then, but like in the whole old Testament, they're looking forward to an anointed one. Yeah. The Messiah, the one who's coming, Mm -hmm. the, the Mashiach. Um, and they refer to that person by the Greek word for Messiah, which is Christ. So Jesus, Jesus's last name wasn't Christ. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Does does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, Sorry, a little sidetrack. Fun there. little sidetrack. I like it. Uh, okay. Three times Christian is used in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. He pointed out, this is a quick Google search that I did too. So I don't even know if it's, I didn't count, but the word disciple supposedly appears 261 times wow. in the New Testament. Just to show you like the way that they were thinking, mm-hmm. um, disciple was what they were after. Not even believer. I could have looked up believer. I'm not even sure if that word shows up. But Jesus was after followers. Yeah. 
So I guess a main question here should be, what does it mean to be a disciple? What does disciple mean to you, Jace? Um, yeah, I, I think it means to be a, a student. I think that where like the student teacher relationship mm. really comes to mind. Um, also just from, I feel like more recent study of like, uh, someone who is a, is it like journeyman, like under, like under, like learn an apprentice, an apprentice. apprentice. Yes. Um, so like I've heard that be described as disciple as well. Sure. Um, so yeah, someone who is studying under someone to eventually do what they're going to do. Which like, we don't live in a culture that does that, but not a lot of people do. From what I understand, that's historically the way that people learned their trade Mm -hmm. was to apprentice under someone. And typically maybe it was like a young man would apprentice his father in the family trade. Mm -hmm. But every now and again, someone would apprentice someone that wasn't in their family. If they wanted to be a blacksmith, they would go into the blacksmith shop and learn metallurgy Mm -hmm. from the one who had done it. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 well, I guess, mm-hmm. all right. I was going to turn the question on you, but you also wrote the, the notes for the podcast. Oh, so sure. it's like, I, I guess we're going to get into what you believe about <laughs> discipleship. <laughs> yeah. I like that picture of apprentice because I'm thinking like, uh, say carpenter carpentry is a fun example. Cause Jesus was one. Um, if you're working with wood or stone, um, you're new, say, to this craft, the, you're the apprentice, and you sit underneath someone who's been doing this for decades, and they hold the instrument a particular way and show you exactly how to strike the wood so that you get a particular effect on the wood. Mm-hmm. And then they hand it to you and tell you to try it. Yeah. And you're clumsy because you don't have muscle memory in this yeah. way yet. And they say, good, almost try this differently. You know, yeah. I'm like picturing teaching someone how to throw a baseball, like work on your follow through or like how to hit mm-hmm. eyes on the ball. You know, like there are these little hints that someone who's done something for a really long time begins to train the, the newbie, the rookie yeah. into, um, and they want to impart everything that they have within that craft or that practice mm-hmm. onto yeah. the disciple. That word is, I mean, that's a pretty rich, colorful way to talk about a follower of Jesus. Totally. Isn't it? Well, it's, it's such a, it's a really rich way to, to even learn something. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of recently, I'm trying to learn how to edit videos for the podcast. Yeah. And if I just read like a how to guide from Adobe, just there's not a lot of like, it's hard for me to grasp actually, but sweet Isaiah here on staff, <laughs> when he sits me down and shows me how to do it, then I'm doing it the way he did it. Huh. And it's just like, it's way, it sticks in my head way more. I don't know. Like, yeah. and I, I think the same way with like, yeah, like a carpenter, you could read how to do it in a textbook, but you're not mm. going to see the exact way his hand held the tool to, uh. to, you know, scrape that, amount of wood off or whatever. Yeah. You're just going to get kind of the step by step. And I think that's what we lose as consumer Christians too, when it's just, yeah, you're there and there's not a lot of engagement. You're kind of there just to be this passive receiver of information or a good time or whatever it is, instead of kind of getting, uh, knit grit, gritty, yeah, down in the dirt, <laughs> down, down into what like community is and discipleship is. And when you're like with, the actual people and your budding yeah. heads or you're like seeing it modeled by someone who has been in the faith longer than you, who is mentoring mm-hmm. you, like how much more rich of a learning experience Whoa. that is. So I, I think, yeah, apprenticeship is a very rich way to view what we are to be doing in our following Christ. That's excellent. It harkens back to when Jesus was going around, he wasn't saying, Hey, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And then there's this incredible miracle. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't say, believe in me and then walk away. Yeah. (laughs) True. (laughs) I am God. Mm -hmm. FYI. Totally. Believe. Mm -hmm. Just keep fishing though. Yeah. 
Hey, Matthew, like, enjoy your tax collector booth. Just recognize that I am God. <laughs> Got it? Sweet. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Say this prayer. Repeat after me. Uh, did it. Awesome. Now just mm-hmm. keep taking more taxes. And yeah. Continue exploiting your brother and sister. <laughs> keep doing exactly what you're doing. <laughs> right. No, Jesus says, follow me. Wow. He tells them to lay down their nets. Well, I don't know if he literally told them. That's not recorded in scripture, but they do. Mm-hmm. Follow me. The rich young ruler, he says, sell all of your things. There's one thing that you lack in entering eternal life. Sell all mm. your things, give all your money to the poor, and then follow me. <laughs> like, I want you to do some things. Yeah. And it looks like walking a way that I am leading. Mm-hmm. And there's this really cool picture that the Jewish people had that when you were following a rabbi, you wanted to follow the rabbi so closely and mimic them so much that the dust that their feet kicked up on the path ahead of you would be over your robes. Wow. That you knew you were following your rabbi well when your robes were caked in the dust of your rabbi. Yeah. Because you're right there. Like I'm mimicking. Yeah, it's like it's like what Darren was talking about, how there has to be yeah, you can't just keep going on what you were doing. There has to be fruit. There has to be something mm-hmm. changing in the way you're living your life for other people, mm-hmm. um, for the community that you're in. Um, there has to be dust on you. If there's not dust on you, if there's not fruit in your life, um, it, it might be a symptom or it might be a uh, whatever it is, like a signal that you might be just a consumer Christian. That's good. So that reminds me of a Bible passage that um, has long been an issue for a lot of like (laughs) Christians. I'm thinking Martin Luther hated this passage because Uh it doesn't sound like we're saved by grace. Mm -hmm. We are saved by grace. Yeah. um, Through faith that not of what we do so that no one can boast. It's a free gift of God. That's what Ephesians two tells us. And James two tells us this, and I just want to read James chapter two, verses 14 through 22, um, kind of a long ish section, but I just think it's really good. So hopefully it's worth it. Yeah. It will be worth it. 100%. It is the word of God. So it's the most authoritative thing Mm -hmm. so far in this podcast. (laughs) Um, what good is it? My brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. It's like, like what I'm doing is the manifestation of the faith that I hold inside myself. Mm -hmm. And if my faith isn't manifest in what I do, then it's not, it's not even faith. It's Mm -hmm. dead. Um, And then this is the point. Verse 19, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. It goes on to talk more about Abraham, but... interesting. What what's standing out to you in that? I mean, it's such a great passage. Was this NASB? This is the ESV, ESV, the English Standard. Um, I just, I mean, it just felt a little bit more alive, <laughs> spirity. Oh, cool. I don't know, just all the stuff on my mind. I'm like, wow, this is just so good. <laughs> I mean, Scripture is always good, Praise. but you know, sometimes. 
sometimes a certain context or translation yeah. just does it just, for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is lovely. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think what we're getting at is just belief in God is not enough. Belief that there is a God belief that Christ Jesus is God. Right. Is great, but that doesn't make you a disciple of Jesus. Hmm. And I don't know if I've always so disassociated those two things. Is that the right way to say that? I think so. Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah. Um, and then I also love his example about Abraham. And then the line, you see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And just the idea of like completed faith got hmm. my mind wandering. But I don't know if that's the point of this passage. Oh, no, that's fun. Because okay. uh, I'm thinking of... Matthew in his tax collector booth, Jesus walks by and says, believe in me. Mm -hmm. Matthew's like, I can do that. Sure. You are the Messiah. Um, it's like his faith is beginning. Yeah. It's not like he, he has the fullness of faith right then. Mm -hmm. It's almost like his faith is just opened and faith really then for him is going to be a lifelong journey. Yeah. And the next step in that faith, is to look at Jesus and hear what he has to say and do it. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, follow me. And at that moment, Matthew is challenged. He has to look at him and say, okay, I sure I had faith that you're the Messiah, but do I have faith enough mm -hmm. to put down my profession as a tax collector and walk after you, whatever you do? Yeah, You're going to command me to do something. I think that your life has enough authority that even if it doesn't make sense to me, even if it's uncomfortable for me, I'm just going to say yes to yeah, you. That's so good. You see how it's like the same faith, but it's further along in the journey of faith. Yeah. I think our lives are, are communal and we're not on our own. And if we were just living our lives isolated on our own, a faith inside of our head would be enough. Hmm. You know, sure. and, but I think there would be doubt in your head of like, even like, would I really do that? You know, like, would I really, whatever, like you could say you would do something, or whatever, but like, yeah, faith is, um, proved, proved by action. Hmm. Yeah. And so uh -huh. I'm, I'm thinking of like, you know, have you ever done one of those, um, leap of faith things at like summer camp? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you could like, it's like, Hey, I rigged this up. Like, do you believe me? Hmm. Like, yeah. Like, sure. yeah. Do you believe it'll save you? Yeah. It'll save my life. I'm not going to fall to my death. Yep. I believe you. The rope is good. Okay. I'm jump off. Ah, you know, like it, there, there's a, there's this, you are hitting up something. And when you do jump off one, you're proving to everyone around you hmm. that you have faith in the wow. work of this person that rigged you up, uh, as well as proving to yourself and like going this next level of like, and then you're able to do that all the time, wow. you know? That's you so realize, good. I don't know. That just came to like, that was the example that came to my mind. And well, I like that picture because imagine there's a crowd there and they're watching you jump off and you're like, I believe I can. Yeah. But you don't. Yeah. What does the crowd think? No, they don't believe you can. No, that rope isn't strong enough to hold you. You mm -hmm. don't actually have faith in that rope. Yeah. Because if you jumped off, if you're so afraid to jump, then you think the rope can't help you. Like what you think you're going to die. Christians or often do is say, it's going to hold me. And you should jump off, huh. you know, but they never jump off too, you wow. know? So it's like, well, your life doesn't look any, like your life does not prove that you have faith in what you believe in. Yeah. And so why would I have faith in that too? Wow. That's good. That's exposing, isn't mm -hmm. it? Oh yeah. And I feel like that's a gift that Darren brought us when he came. Mm -hmm. It's like he handed us this problem and said, Hey, if you actually are following Jesus, if you actually believe in Jesus, yeah. maybe not even you're actually following him. If you believe in him and call yourself a Christian, you call him by his name, call yourself by his name. Does that mean Christian? Does that sure. call him by your, that's what I meant to yeah, say. Now yeah. I'm all sloppy with you're my good. words. Uh, but if you identify with Christ, will I know it if I come over to your house? Mm-hmm. And I observe the way that you treat your spouse yeah. and your children or your neighbor. If we go out to eat, will I recognize that you love like Jesus by the way that you treat your waitress? Mm -hmm. 
Or the way that you treat the homeless man that we walked past while we were on our way into the restaurant. Yeah. Or, Is it, it, or if Jesus goes through your checkbook or your browsing history. Whoa. You know, those things, he's mentioned that too in the last I podcast. like that he used the word browsing history. Yeah. Thankfully, I'm feeling like the Lord has sanctified my browsing history. But, you know, yes. there's there's yeah. there's times in my life where I would not have been okay with Jesus looking at my browsing history. Yeah. Absolutely. Me too. And that needs to be shaped mm -hmm. into Christ likeness, mm -hmm. all facets of our life. Otherwise we're not really following him. And I would, I would venture to say that if we're not really following him, then we don't actually believe that he is who he says he is. Like our faith isn't complete. Maybe yeah. our faith has begun. Mm -hmm. Maybe we believe that we can jump, but we believe that the rope is strong enough, but not enough to actually do it. Then like that faith is dead according to James. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and I think that it also, people are like, this justifies like works for salvation. And it really, it does not talk about that at all. No, we're not talking about salvation. Yeah. Yeah. This different conversation. Faith and yeah. The proof of discipleship. And I, I'm glad that you bring that up because I know that that can be a trauma point for a lot of people because mm -hmm. there's spiritual manipulation that a lot of churches have gone through. And I just want to speak really directly to that. If anybody feels like we're trying to um, layer on some kind of legalism in this conversation and yeah. say, actually all these things are required of you in order to enter into eternal life. Like the good news of Jesus is that his blood alone opens the, the door for you to enter into mm -hmm. eternal life. You just have to accept it. Yeah. It's not a heavy burden. Mm -mm. It's an easy yoke. Amen. It's like an easy, it's a, it's a light thing to attach yourself to. Yoke. Right. I'm like we use yoke all the time. Yeah. <laughs> never I've never actually anymore. like yoked an animal to another animal before. Yeah. So that metaphor is just kind of biblical for yeah, me. Yeah, for sure. Else. <laughs> no, but I'm glad you, I am glad you said that because I, I think if you feel like this is heavy, I, I think just spend some more time with Jesus and you're like, I want to follow you closer and closer and closer. Wow. You know, yeah. if it, if this feels like, like kind of overwhelming, it's, I think there might be a, an opportunity to get to know this Jesus that we're following, that we're talking about, that we have like laid our lives down for ministry for, wow. um, because it's so worth it Amen. because he's so incredible. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure what that looks like for you, whether it's spending more time in scripture or, or, uh, some deeper prayer sessions. But I think that's, that's mm. where it's like, it's our joy. It's the, joy set before Christ and us to, to yoke ourselves to him. Amen. To, to die to ourselves and pick up our cross and become disciples, true disciples, willing to prove our faith by our actions, not as some legalism, but it's like, it's the joy of my life to prove my faith mm. because like you're so good. And I see my faith worked out over and over again and completed over and over again by the risks that I'm taking. Wow because I see you in breaking into this world um, through your spirit and people's lives are being changed. Right. Come on. Wow. Come on. Whatever that like proverbial dr jumping off the platform and trusting the rope is mm -hmm. for me, for you, maybe it's tithing. Maybe you've never given any money to a church Yeah. to just go ahead and give 10% would feel like a massive leap of faith. Totally. Especially for, I mean, a lot of people in their financial journey. Mm -hmm. That's scary. Or do if, it, do or, it and see what he does. Yeah. Or if you're, <laughs> or if it's just giving up an hour of your day to, to spend with him. Wow. Like that's a big yeah. commitment, you it, know? It's huge. And there's like so many things asking for our time. Hmm. And so to just give up our time is, is a huge thing. Hmm. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of examples. Give up a meal. Mm-hmm volunteer in kids ministry totally. and give up the Sunday experience. So you're not consuming another Sunday service. You're serving people's children so that they can go yeah. to that Sunday. Service. And you're discipling the children and, as well. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It's not just a matter of like watching. That's not what we believe at River It's House. not daycare. It's not daycare. It's right. like they're making little disciples. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Wow, I'm glad you corrected me on that. Oh, I, no, speak well I enough. mean, you said serving. That's completely fine. I just wanted to make that point. This is a quote that Darren Roundson read from Dallas Willard. 
on the Sunday that he preached a couple weeks ago. I just want to read it again because it was just too good. He said the name Dallas Willard a lot. Who is Dallas Willard? Oh, I'm honestly, it's, this is funny. I've read so much of Dallas Willard. Mm-hmm. I don't even know who the guy is. I he, I'm exposed. Um, I mean, he's a theologian. Theologian, wrote a lot of books. That's what I know. Um, and he was a professor, I believe. Yeah, I'm trying to remember like where or what he's most famous for. Let me see. Um, American philosopher and theologian known for his writings on Christian spiritual formation. I mean, he's really famous for like, yeah, spiritual formation, meaning things about the disciplines. Um, uh, but did he teach at Fuller? Do you know? Yeah. It looks like he died in Pasadena, California, which is where Fuller is. Okay. So I think he must have been associated with Fuller. Isn't that funny? I've read so much of him and I just don't know. It's really okay. Okay. Well, um, someone out there knows it's probably Danica. Um, (laughs) so feel free to go onto our YouTube and comment down below. Who is Dallas Willard? Yes. And um, in 500 words or less. Next time we'll talk about him, we'll have a little more context for you. But this is the quote, and I Mm -hmm. love it. This is in light of everything that we've been saying. It's wordy, so try and follow along. The greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who, by profession or culture, are identified as Christians will become disciples students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. Wow. Isn't that great? That's really good. Every corner of human existence needs the kingdom of heaven. And as, I mean, humans are in every corner of human existence. Mm -hmm. Imagine that humans in each of those corners carried the spirit of the living God with them and brought the kingdom into each of those corners. That's the greatest issue facing the world today is that Christians would actually embody Christ so that the goodness of Christ can go everywhere that his followers go. Yeah. Isn't that stunning? It is really good. And I, I wouldn't have, if someone said, what's the greatest issue of our world today? I don't know if I would have said that. Wow. You know? Yeah. And, but, I would say this, the greatest issue of the world today is whether those who identify as Christians will become disciples or not. Mm -hmm. Like I know us Christians becoming disciples is the solution for two through a hundred greatest issues of the world. Wow. You know, I believe Yeah. if we, if, if all the Christians like, was like, we're all like, just so like Christ as they can be Mm -hmm. and are doing what Christ did. I think issues two through a hundred would be solved in many capacities. Oh, isn't that cool? Minimized at the least, you know? Right. Uh, Resources would be allocated in a way that took care of the poor, Mm -hmm. hunger. Violence wouldn't be a first resort. Nope. There's a lot. Wow. Greed. Mm -hmm. I'm Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. Comparison and consumption and all those things. Even like stewardship of the environment might yeah. look, would look different. Yeah. I'm convinced I, mm-hmm. if we were really disciples, wow, it would be holistic because that's the thing. Families would look different. Divorce oh. would be almost non-existent. Alcoholism, it, yeah. addiction, depression, anxiety. Whoa. Say that mm-hmm. because it's holistic. And yes. I think that's another thing that Darren really did a good job highlighting when he was here with us. So that the way of Christ is not about a Sunday gathering period. It's not about what happens to you after you die. It's about every facet of your whole being, mm-hmm. your whole existence, the yeah. way you treat your spouse and your kids, what you read, what you listen to, um, not just to put rules around it, but to make you the most full of life, abundant person that you possibly could have been created to be, which is how God created you to be. So good. Right? Yeah. It's holistic. Holistic. Very holistic. I think that's, as we go through this series, um, talking about these different um, dichotomies between consumer Christian and radical discipleship, Mm -hmm. they touch on all of us. That's good. Every part of our lives. And maybe there we should transition to the first of the seven. Yeah. 
dichotomies. Mm -hmm. I was using the word contrasts. Contrast is better. Um, Dichotomy might not be the right word. Maybe it's almost, I I think the word contrast does it. Perfect. Um, because yeah, what we're doing is we're pitting against each other a way that a consumeristic Christian might live who is still identifying with Christ, but in a consumeristic way. And then a radical disciple, radical Mm -hmm. being like so radical that I would leave my nets. I would leave my father's profession and Mm -hmm. boat to follow. Like the rich young ruler would have actually sold all that he had given to the poor. Like that's radical discipleship, Mm -hmm. whatever it looks like for each of us. Um, and it's different for each of us. Mm-hmm. I, I'm realizing how much I bring up the rich young ruler when I talk about just faith. I bring him up all the time. It's such a tragic story. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. So over the next, what well, this one is number one. Mm-hmm. And then the three following this, we're going to talk about a total of seven different contrasts that Darren laid out for us. Um, and hopefully that will help expose some practical asset aspects of what consumeristic Christianity looks like versus radical discipleship. And I know this is going to be personally convicting for me yeah. in any way that I see that consumeristic Christian inside mm-hmm. myself. I want to root that out and pursue more holistic discipleship. Totally. Don't you think? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm okay. going to, I feel the same way. I have a question cause I talked about all that I've learned from, Darren, uh, with my sweet wife and I use the word convicting a lot. Mm. And she was like, I'm not sure if that's the right word because a lot of this you didn't know or weren't aware of. Oh, so it's not like you were like choosing sin or something. Yeah. And I wanted to pick your brain on that real fast. And I thought it'd be an interesting thing to talk about before Mm. we get into this. It's like, is it cutting? Is it challenging? Is it convicting? Is convicting hold more weight? Yeah. Just with our, like, that our words might mean something, you know? Well, now I just want to look up the definition of conviction. Totally. Um, a definition. Because to me, it is convicting, whether I knew about it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, it says a formal declaration of someone as guilty of a criminal offense. <laughs> uh, a firmly held belief or opinion is a conviction. Sure. Like I'm a man of convictions. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's a different use of it. Um, but like a interesting, a formal declaration, there's a more, um, more Christianese definition to that Mm -hmm. than just the act of finding a person guilty of a crime. Um, but to me, I think when I feel conviction, what it is, is Hey, I have been walking in some way that is contrary to the way of Christ Mm -hmm. and someone, the Holy Spirit, a person like Darren illuminated by the Holy Spirit just came with a flashlight and shined it right on the way that I have not been following Jesus. Oh, and there's a little bit of like a piercing in my heart. It's like, oof, I I feel that I don't want, I don't want in any way to not be following Christ. Um, and that feeling, that piercing, that cutting is conviction to me. Yeah. No, I think, and I found this on Webster, mm-hmm. convict as a verb, um, convicted, convicting, convicts. One is to find or prove to be guilty okay. or to convince of error or sinfulness. Oh, to so convince of error. To convince it. Like I've, like I've, I've, I, and that's how I feel like a lot of these things. I've been convinced that I'm not doing this right. Sure. That I'm in error, you know? Yeah. In error, and I think sinfulness is good as we remember that to to sin means to miss the mark. Um, Have you heard that before? Mm-hmm. That's what sin literally means. Um, I always picture like I'm Robin Hood firing arrows or something, mm-hmm. and to hit the bullseye is great, but to miss the bullseye is to miss the mark. That's to sin, mm-hmm. even if I'm a little bit off of the bullseye. Yeah. Um, so it's like, that would be a form of conviction, I guess, if I'm an mm-hmm. archer and I hit the target wrong. Yeah. Conviction is like, oh, an error mm-hmm. occurred there. Let yeah. me fix that error. It doesn't have to be this shameful thing. It, yeah. I, I think maybe that's the distinction. Mm-hmm. Um, if if anyone feels conviction, uh, I I personally know that 
that's it's not of God to turn that conviction into some kind of brooding shame, yeah. which is where you start to see something wrong with your identity. Like, oh, I am just an inherently, yeah. I don't know, fungal mess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. like, bummer. I suck. Bummer. <laughs> like, that's that's where it's turned yeah. to something really unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and conviction isn't inherently that. Okay. Does that make sense? That's great. I think I'm glad we kind of flushed that out. At least that's the way I think of it. Maybe Laura has great thoughts for me too. I'd be curious to hear what she has to say. True. Cool. We'll have to have her comment on the uh, YouTube. Yeah, she'll comment down below. Love you, babe. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell notification. <laughs> <laughs> Such an influencer. I know. Um, which is so ironic considering everything that Darren said about podcasters. Oh. <laughs> you consume a podcast. Mm-hmm. Let's just say that if you are only consuming this podcast and it's not influencing the way that you live your life, just stop listening to it, please. <laughs> uh, but please unsubscribe. I think there is something to say about our thoughts slowly, even shaping the way that we live and who we are. Like what we dwell on uh-huh. is important. And so to dwell on a podcast about discipleship probably can't be a bad thing. It probably can't be a bad thing. It the might worst just... thing about that is us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might just make us look hypocritical if we're here talking about it and then not actually walking the walk, which it's is a, you've got, we've got a good accountability group. We do. Everyone listening can hold us accountable to Thanks, guys. the way of the kingdom. Wow. Now I feel pressure. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Holy yeah. pressure. Okay, so he didn't, Darren didn't add this question to it, but I put the question on it. Um, What is my authority? Mm -hmm. This is the first of the seven contrasts. Um, A consumeristic Christian might answer that question by saying that, um, well, I choose to live with my personal experience as my highest authority. Mm Mm-hmm. Whether I'm making decisions, I'm guided by my desires to direct the affairs of my life. Did that make sense? Yeah. So like personal experience, um, my authority, let's say like, oh, that could be opening a huge can of worms. Um, We can always close back up real fast. Yeah, I guess we can. We can try. I mean, I was thinking about sexuality. Okay. Um, Our individual experience Mm -hmm. and maybe we don't have to go into lgbtq but just sexuality in general maybe Mm -hmm. let's just do that okay um though all of this could be explored uh and maybe uh, what we could do alcohol we could do all kinds of things say alcohol oh my experience is Mm -hmm. like i i can have a few drinks yeah every single night and it's fun and it's not hurting anyone else. It's not hurting anyone. So, I'll in fact, I, I socialize with people. I'm bonding with people. Mm-hmm. I'm going out to the bars and like exposing myself to really like people that I wouldn't otherwise be around. And so I'm fostering community. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've never hurt anyone, yeah. even on the nights when I've had a lot to drink. I haven't blacked out. Yeah. I've never. You know, totally. my personal experience, uh, This, uh, I'm yeah. speaking hypothetically here. This isn't actually me. <laughs> yes. Um, for the record. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but hypothetically, my personal experience has never made me feel like drinking in excess is a bad thing. Yeah. So when I read the Bible and it says drunkenness is not the way of Christ, I dismiss that. And I say, ah, they must be meaning like something else totally drunkenness and violence you know <laughs> sure you know sure uh, yeah you i feel like you can so easily justify it with your own experience mm. with so many things that's really good even like in a more benign way well depending it's like well i've never seen god work that way huh i've never experienced the holy spirit move in a service before therefore if it does happen it's not that's that doesn't fit into my box, you know, oh. even though you have read through the new Testament many times 
And you've seen Jesus do many miraculous things and you've seen the church of acts do many miraculous things Red, Um, when you see it for yourself, that's not God. Wow. Cause I haven't experienced it myself. That's good. That's, I think that's exposing to past Benjamin when I first came to river house mm-hmm. and was witnessing people speaking in tongues and even like shaking. Yeah. Falling on the floor. Holy laughter. I, I'm sitting there thinking my experience has no grid yeah. for this. This, therefore, because mm-hmm. it's in contrast with my experience, this has to be made up. Yeah. The people are performing. They're trying to act spiritual. And I, I didn't have any yeah. like charity or hospitality for that experience. I think even when that was you, and if this still is you, the listener, like... It's not like you're choosing to be high and mighty. Like you've Mm -hmm. seen people dedicated to the Lord your whole life in a very different context. And which is also not bad. It just Mm -hmm. didn't include those things. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but if you're willing to just kind of shut off people and shut off, especially other believers for the sake of your own experience, Mm -hmm. I think that's where our hearts need to be checked. Um, But for us to initially have those like, you know, disconnections in our head, is it makes sense. Cause that's our lives. You know, that is, that is the experience we have lived. The whole point of this radical discipleship is that cannot be the highest, mm. um, court in our minds. Right. It's good. It makes sense that that would be a natural thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, because I understand reality based on my experience. Oh yeah. You know, like I understand that, this object I'm holding is a mug and I know what it does because of the experience in my life. If I'd never interacted with one of these objects before, um, I might be confused. Totally. If I'd only consumed liquids straight out of a faucet of a sink, I'd be like, what is this? What's this weird shovel? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So my experience gives me understanding of my surroundings. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we have to be aware of when our experiences are challenged by a reality that might be new that we're facing and hold those things against scripture. Yes, I think, and this is this is the contrast. I think, it's, I think it is good to hold to these convictions mm-hmm. that you have through your experience, but, and then weigh them against all the other stuff you see in the world the one thing that should outweigh it always is the authority of God and scripture scripture. And Amen. that's what Darren's talking about with radical discipleship. Amen. Cause I, I feel like we were kind of getting into this, like, I don't know, amorphous uh-huh. experience is true thing. Sure. And I wanted to tie it down to that. What we're contrasting is can I read the what radical disciples oh, yeah. said, please radical disciples live the word of God and allow scripture to, to be authority in directing the affairs of our lives, to be the authority. Whoa. Which like, man, honestly, scripture says this about drunkenness. I believe it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't want to say that so much, but if, if scripture is saying something that's that cut and dry, yeah. I mean, nowhere does the Bible say anything that might lead you to believe that over drinking is a justifiable thing according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So that seems to settle the conversation if scripture is the authority. Here's an example. I don't like talking to people in public, (laughs) hypothetically. Sure. Um, (laughs) And I, I've like been told stranger danger my whole life. And it's just, it's best to keep to myself. Sure. You know, it's, I don't want to bother people. Mm -hmm. Like the world says, you know, live your own life. Don't bother others. Uh, the Bible, Jesus explicitly calls us to make disciples. Wow. To be interaction, to, to see the broken and the healing, the broken, the widow, the orphan, the sick, the lame, the homeless, the naked, and then to interact, to go, Mm -hmm and um, be an active part in bringing heaven to earth. But I think we really kind of put that on other people and we kind of dismiss that call because life is so much more comfortable here and I don't want to bother others. I don't want to like set them off the wrong way or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but as radical disciples, we're supposed to read those scriptures and have it 
change our heart and our mind and be the authority of our life too. So when we life, so that when we see people out in the wild, Mm. we are to engage and interact. That's great. And make disciples and be in community. That's a great example. I'm convicted even by that example. (laughs) (laughs) So I, I am not, I'm not perfect at this either. Yeah. And have lots, many levels to grow. As Jesus says in Matthew 25, as you have done to the least of these, so you've done to me. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you see the homeless person who's hungry and you got that person a meal, Mm -hmm. you fed Jesus. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Heaven help me in all the times that I've bypassed that person. Mm -hmm. And not to say that you should give money to every homeless person. I think there's like wisdom that has to be weighed there, which is, which is part of what makes this whole conversation complicated. It, not all of it is so cut and dry. Yeah. I mean, even like drunkenness, there's debates on, well, is, is drunkenness when you have one full glass, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Yeah, totally. Or how much, how much alcohol even gets you to that point. So even there, there's like gray in the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and wisdom has to be held in this and, you sh- you can see how quickly it is to justify not doing something not which is i guess between us and the lord maybe we should be handling all of these conversations prayerfully maybe yeah. <laughs> I, Clearly. I, th- I think i believe there's like you know t- to see a homeless person and not to give them the time of day is not what christ would do hmm. but maybe that person hasn't been looked in the eye all day and what you can do is say hello and look them in the eye mm-hmm. and acknowledge that they're there. And if prompted to whatever, to be mm-hmm. in tune with the Holy Spirit, X, Y, Z happens, you know, yeah. um, you either feel prompted to leave it at that mm-hmm. and that there is, you know, something deeper going on, or you feel prompted to engage. Hey, how can I help? Mm-hmm. Let me get you something. That's Let me, good. do you want some groceries? You know, like you, like you just, you start somewhere. Mm-hmm. I I'm, don't know. I don't know. Where was it going? I'm reminded of a, an interaction I had, very small interaction on my honeymoon just a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago in Sevilla, Spain. Wow. I had the most privileged opportunity to go to Spain and Portugal for my honeymoon. And there was a woman in a street that was asking for money. I didn't have any cash Mm -hmm. when she was asking. I said, I'm sorry, I don't have any cash. That kind of experience happened quite a few times, you know, as it does in a big city, even small cities. But this lady said, but you gave me a smile. Oh, wow. And that's the second best thing. If you can't give me money, you can give me a smile. So thanks for that smile. That's amazing. And I think she like kind of said it in jest, but she also meant it. I'm really pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Because I imagine that she's just ignored Mm -hmm. all day long. Yeah. So instead of like getting a smile, people avert their eyes. Yeah. Walk quickly past her to try and ignore the situation that's uncomfortable as much as possible. So I'm glad that you said what you said. Like I try ever since working at a homeless um, shelter. Mm Mm-hmm. I try to at least make eye contact and smile yeah. to acknowledge in my nonverbal contact there that humanity exists in the person. I think that's really hmm. beautiful. Hmm. That's a good practice for all of us to have. At least that. Yeah. I think it's good. And maybe at most it could look like prayer, stopping and praying for that person, hearing their story, inviting mm-hmm. them to a meal. Anyway, that, that got really specific on homeless ministry, but True. it's a good example yeah. of how, um, like you should allow the word of God to be your authority. Mm-hmm. Um, there are all kinds of places around scripture like that, like love your enemies. Yeah. Or, you know, one f- for me is just not talking bad about people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, totally any form of gossip or slander. Um, even if it's just a little bit it's like, I want to be the kind of person that is honoring to everyone all the time, whether they're around or not. And that's the biblical way. When you read scripture, that's what you should hear mm-hmm. the command being. Um, 
but it's just easy to kind of grow numb and be like, oh, well, yeah, no, totally. I'll say what I want about whoever I want, whenever I want. And there's a, there's a different line that my innate, Mm -hmm. like kind of flesh is comfortable drawing. Yeah. That's not as holy or Christ-like as the one that scripture wants to draw. So Mm -hmm. let's let scripture draw that line for us and do our best to conform to it. Yeah. Come Mm -hmm. on. Don't you think? Yeah. Hmm. That might be a good place to wrap it up. I think so. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. In summary, do you want to be the kind of person that consumes in your Christianity or the kind of person who actually follows Jesus with your whole life? Yeah. A disciple. We're going to unpack other ways that that looks in the next few podcasts, but yeah, that's a good place to land the plane. If there has been anything in this conversation that has felt convicting to you, listener, I just encourage you to talk with somebody about it. Invite community into that thing. Um, Maybe someone in our church, in your house church, in your family, um, has a perspective that would help point you closer to Christ in that way. Yeah. You know, if you have something that you need to repent of, yeah, please do it again. Don't let this just be a podcast that you listen to, but allow it to be an inspiration to really walk the walk and make the actions of your life more like Christ's. So good. Hmm. It's good. Yeah. When we share our convictions with others, the things that are convicting to us, we are then held accountable Mm -hmm. as well. That's a beauty of community. Wow. And that helps us to become more like Jesus, more uh, reformed and sanctified. Hmm. I'm reminded of something that Darren said a couple different times while he was with us. I'm not sure he ever said it in a more public setting, Um, but with the staff, he talked about having an accountability group that holds one another accountable to living the way of the kingdom. Yeah. And he said, it's not just about sin. Like, Hey, have you sinned? Are you, um, keeping up with your like, yeah, I don't know the boundaries that you've set for yourself or Mm -hmm. whatever. He said, no, actually my accountability group, I go to them when I'm about to make a large financial purchase and I submit that purchase to them so that I'm managing my money. Like I ought to in the kingdom Yeah, and so on and so forth. We hold one another. Have you prayed for prayed for healing for someone recently, you know, holding people accountable to those, those types of, um, calls and and goals of the life of Jesus. You want to, you want to be accountability partners in that way? Yeah, let's do it. I'm in. Boom. Cheers. All right. Well, here we are. Thanks everyone for joining us for the deep waters podcast. Yeah. Uh, as we've said before, please send us, any emails, questions, thoughts, concerns you have, the email is deepwaters at riverhouseministries.com. Yeah. Or grab us on Sundays. Mm-hmm. Just shake us down with all your questions. <laughs> and I will give you less answers than Benjamin will. So go to him. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now that we're on YouTube, even if you don't watch it on YouTube, if you want to post comments there, if that's easier for you. Mm-hmm. We all watch YouTube in some form or capacity. So. Right. That's great. Leave us messages. Can't wait. That's so fun. Wow. And we'll see you in the comments, friends. (laughs) Sounds good. We love you guys. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Deep Waters Podcast. If you have comments, questions, or concerns, maybe even a recipe or two, please send them to deepwaters at riverhouseministries.com. And if you would like to join us at Riverhouse for Sunday service, We meet at the Vineyard Boise at 4 p.m. We'd love to see you there. We could not do this podcast without a little help from our friends. Our theme music was written and recorded by the Riverhouse Worship Team. Production is done by Jordan Sodeman. Special thanks to Isaiah Guerrero for our artwork. Benjamin Olson writes and co-hosts with me, Jace Langley, and I also edit this bad boy. If you like this podcast and want to keep going on this journey of discipleship with us, please leave us a review wherever you listen to the Deep Waters podcast. May Christ be with you wherever you go.